This is April, folks, and it's the final four of the NIT. And guess who's there? Of course, your Seton Hall Pirates, and they did it by whooping UNLV's ass all over Walsh Gym like it was 1989 all over again. And by the way, it is crazy to think that 1989, Seton Hall played UNLV for the right to go to the Final Four and won by 23. In the NIT in the NIT this year, Seton Hall had a chance to beat UNLV to go to the NIT Final Four. They win by 23, and we're going to talk about that and, of course, preview the NIT Final Four at Historic Hinkle Fieldhouse on this edition of Hoist the Colors. Welcome in. I'm Tim Best. He's Pat Madden. Well, I mean, in terms of a kind of performance that you would anticipate Seton Hall to have, given that they struggled in the first round and then got better in the second round, the crescendo, I hope this isn't the highest crescendo, because... What a performance and what a clinic scene I'll put on against the running Rebels. Yeah, I, that, that was that game was pretty much over not long into it. Uh, you could tell right off the bat that that, that Seton Hall was running on all cylinders. Jaden Bediaco gets off to a fast start against an undersized UNLV backcourt. And then that starts to open things up for Alamir Dawes who just went berserk. The, the, the stretch that I think everyone's going to remember is the stretch uh, early in the second half when he just drops three threes right on top to take a, I think the game was 18 points at the time, and he made it a 27-point game, and it was basically over at that point. Uh, just that that was the, that was probably one of the highlights of Dawes's uh, Seton Hall career just dropping the three. And, you know, he says in the press conference afterwards that, you know, he knew he was going on a heat check, but that's what Alamir Dawes does. That is why he is, he's been a game changer the last two years because he's the guy who takes five or six point games and makes them 12 to 15 point games. So that was precisely part of what he did on Wednesday night. I don't think anybody... Uh, at least the starting five at Seton Hall. None of those guys had a bad night. Uh, and then they got a lot of support coming off the bench. Uh, Sandre Naganga uh, scores seven points out of nowhere. Uh, Jaquan Sanders uh, hits a couple of shots. Even Arza, uh, even Arda, uh, yep. you know, who's been in hiding for the, for the last two months, finds his way to get a couple of points on the board. So I think that was just... You know, it, it was just a dominant performance, top to bottom, uh, against the UNLV team that probably, you know, when they fell 15, 18 points behind, just was sort of, you know, running, playing out, playing out the string in that second half. I think they sort of just knew that they had, they were, they were beaten, they were beaten by a better team, uh, and you know, they they can go back and you know, go back and regroup. Uh, where Seton Hall now moves on to uh, the big ones, uh, the big one on Tuesday night. I mean, my takeaways, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, you want to talk about, you know, like the great start to the second half. I mean, what a punctuation to end the first half with Dylan Adebusu getting the steal and then just an emphatic dunk, like right at the halftime horn. I mean, that was incredible i mean it honestly reminded me how they ended the first half and started the second half very much remnant of the saint john's game back in the middle of january i mean just you get the kill shot early in the second half like you're like okay all right now now like you just knew this is an unstoppable tide especially after the unlv barstool page tried to talk shit about walsh i'm like <laughs> i hope they reap what they sow and they did and then some i mean it they clearly deserved it. And by the way, and great point about the bench, by the way, because you didn't have Isaiah Coleman and you didn't have Elijah Hutchins effort. So you really had to rely on I mean Jaquan Sanders was the acting six man and he got his got a got a couple threes to fall. But uh Sadrake Nganga for him he got a bucket in the first half. I'm like, oh, oh, this is the kind of night we're having. That's when you kind of knew. Okay, this is Seton Hall's night, and it just it just kept piling on, and you get Arda getting a bucket, um, and UNLV just they didn't have any answers to anybody. Which again, Seton Hall needed this kind of game, like to have that kind of performance. 
to propel them into the NIT Final Four, man, I just I I was smiling ear to ear from tip off to the final whistle. Uh, I could not be more proud of this team and the performance that they put on uh, Wednesday night at Walsh in the in their final home game of the year. I mean, what a, what a send off! Right, and again, you know, the, the, there has unfortunately too many times this season not been that next man up mentality. Uh, you know, there, there were a lot of nights where you would love to have gotten something more from the deeper part of the bench. Uh, you know, even even we talked about, you know, Coleman's big game against North Texas uh, in the second round and the fact that it was probably, you know, that Coleman's good performances in the last two months of the season have unfortunately been few and far between. Uh, so then you can... So, so then you can see something, you get something out of Sanders, you get something out of Naganga, uh, you know, David Tubek, another guy who unfortunately didn't get to see a lot of the court this season, in part because he was injured and in part because by the time he's up and ready to get playing time, you're in the middle of Big East action. And it's hard to incorporate a guy who didn't see a lot of non-conference action into your rotation in Big East play, it's just something that that just doesn't happen on a regular basis. So for for those guys to have seen the court to get some action, you know, it it's something. You know, again, it's it's bittersweet because you wish you had seen more of that during the season. Because you know, having having a better bench could have been a difference in a couple of those closer. You know, like for example, the Providence game back in January that we lost at the Rock because Kadari Richmond wasn't around. Well, what if, you know, what if you got better production from Jaquan Sanders that night? What if you got better production from Sandre Nagang? What if you've gotten these guys to maybe pick up some of the slack for Kadari Richmond that night? Maybe that that loss becomes a win. You know, that that's one of those that's one of those, you know, what ifs. So, but then again, let's let's not even look at that. That's something that we can talk about. You know, when we can talk about that when the season's over, let's hope because when we get to Tuesday night, Isaiah Coleman apparently is not going to be in Indianapolis. Uh, he's still battling whatever he was battling last week against UNLV. So it's going to be up again to Sanders, Naganga, uh, maybe two back to become those next men up in case you know, not only in case somebody gets in foul trouble, but also to give people a blow. Uh, because, you know, even though you are in a winner, winner go home situation, you are still in the first week of April. And a lot of minutes have piled up with the starting five. So you need people, you need these deep bench guys to step up and at least be able to be serviceable so that you can give people a blow because, you know, Dre Davis can play 40 minutes. Alamir Doris can play 40 minutes, but I don't think Jaden Bediaco and Kadari Richmond have 40 minutes in them. I think the best, you know, you're going to get 30, 30 to 35 effective minutes. So then you need some minutes from Sanders, Naganga, and, and the rest of those guys uh, to put Seton Hall in the best position they can be in to win Tuesday night against Georgia, and then Thursday night against whoever they're playing in the final. And so uh, a couple things. Number one, Willie relieved that EHE made the trip at least. Um, I, it's a, It sucks. I mean, I would have – it would have been really, really important for Coleman to be there. But, you know, when you're sick, like – it sucks. You got to stay back because, you know, you don't want to, you know, have that affect the rest of the team. Uh, but, you know – that's why EHE being there, that's going to be important because you've got to have size um, to back up Betty Uh, You know, where they were able to get away with it against a smaller UNLV team. But against Georgia, you might have a little bit of leeway. But if you're going up against Indiana State or Utah, I don't think you're going to be able to get away with it. So it's good that EHE um, was able to make the trip. Um, they need his size and also his ability to pop out and, you know, take a three or two, maybe even knock down a three um, to, you know, give them a little bit of, you know, separation and momentum, like, you know, a three from him. Cause you know, he's one of the 
last guys you expect to hit a three, like that will give them a boost um, that they're, you know, trailing a little bit. Maybe they spark a little bit of a run. But another thing um, that's crazy that I called my shot last week regarding UNLV playing in Walsh after playing at Princeton the week prior to that and then having to go back to Vegas and now go back to New Jersey also didn't help the fact that they got stuck in an elevator for an hour. Um, but still, <laughs> like, I think the travel ended up catching up to them and, and that other and, uh, and that other factor of, you know, like, oh, you get stuck in an elevator for an hour. Like, what do you do? Um, it, it gets mentally draining, especially the travel. So I'm glad, you know, like, I'm going to pat myself on the back and like, you know, nice job <laughs> yeah, for calling that the travel and all that would ultimately affect their performance. I'm not saying it, it broke them and made Seton Hall win the game, but like, I clearly knew what I was talking about. So um, we'll just leave it at that. Let's talk about this Georgia matchup. The Bulldogs, they finished as the 11th seed in the SEC. Um, they have some talent. Mike White's their coach. He previously coached at Florida and where he had some good seasons down in Gainesville. Um, this Georgia team, they beat Xavier. Um, they, got, they got lucky in that because there should have been a foul called. Um, when Desmond Claude went up for the final shot, they didn't, they, they swallowed the whistle, Georgia won by two. Uh, and then after that, you know, they got two quality road wins. They beat Wake Forest and Ohio state. Um, uh, I believe this is the first time St. Hall's facing Georgia since the Big East championship season, 2015, 16, uh, Thanksgiving weekend. I, re- I remember that game. Well, um, where Isaiah Whitehead hit the dagger three, um, to beat the dogs, um, at the rock. Uh, but what's your assessment of this Georgia team in the matchup that um, it'll, that's presented to this Pirates team? Well, I don't – it's – Georgia is a team that is a classic underachieving team uh, that's managed to find something in the NIT for what it's worth. Uh, you know, they, they, they face – you know, they, when you get to draw a Xavier team that's under 500 in the first round – uh, it, that would be a real disappointment to lose that one. But then to go to places like Wake Forest and Ohio State, uh, you know, Wake Forest was on the bubble for most of the month of February. And Ohio State had made a pretty good charge to get into the NCAA tournament conversation. Uh, so th- those are two really nice wins. Uh, their leading scorer is a guy who is familiar to a lot of Northeastern basketball fans in Noah Tomlinson. Uh, he, uh, was, uh, one of the leading scorers in the Mac. Uh, he played at Niagara. Uh, mm-hmm. he had also been a guy who St. John's, uh, had targeted in the portal, uh, last spring. Uh, but he ended up for whatever reason, good, bad, or otherwise, ending up playing at Georgia and becoming their leading scorer. Uh, they also have another guy, uh, I forgot what, what they have another guy, another guard who's also their only other double digit scorer. Uh, There were two interesting facts I noticed about Georgia in terms of their statistics. One is that they have a point. They have only scored 17 more points than their opponents. If you look at the the games that they won and games that they've lost, their their point differential all season is half a point a game. Uh, And for a team that's in a power conference like the SEC, uh, that sort of tells you that uh, they're not they're not really the best team, you know, out there. Uh, and the second thing is they get out rebounded. They've been out rebounded all season. Another thing which you don't like to see if you're a power conference, if you're a power because you you would think that you would dominate your non conference opponents and then you would be competitive enough in conference games. Uh, their best win this season was a win at South Carolina. I think that was in the early part of January. Uh, and then they didn't beat any other top end SEC teams the rest of the season. So, you know, again, it, it's on the one hand, it's an underperforming thing. On the other hand, it could be that they're using the in in sort of a similar vein that Seton Hall is using it. They're seeing the NIT as a redemption tour. It's something where at the end of the season, if they can win, two more games, they get to hang a banner on this season. It's an NIT banner and everyone sort of knows what that sort of means. But on the other hand, it's something like, okay, you know, we didn't wash this season away. We got something out of it. 
So, you know, at, at this point, you know, it, and I think there's also sort of mentality in this situation. And I think every, I think the three other teams other than Indiana State walk into this final four out in Indianapolis sort of with nothing to lose. Uh, you know, the, you, you basically, you know, again, it's, you know, you want to win these games, but on the other hand, you know, you, you, you sort of accept what the situation is. I think Indiana State, and I know we're not, we'll, we'll hit upon them a little bit later. I think Indiana State's got a little more pressure on them, and and I'll sort of tell you my theory about that after we, you know, finish our discussion of this Georgia game. So um, the other guy I think you're thinking about is Jab uh, Jabri Abdurrahim, South Orange native. Uh, by the way, um, I, I just as I was browsing, um, that's what I that's what I found. Um, the one thing I will say about Georgia so far in this tournament, um, other than the game against Xavier, they've been hitting their threes. Like they've hit, they hit 14 against Wake, 10 against Ohio State. So they've been lighting it up from three. Um, but Seton Hall, to their credit, they've defended the three point arc pretty well in this NIT. Um, against St. Joe's, uh, they, I mean, they made 10 three pointers, but on 38 attempts. Against North Texas, uh, the Mean Green, 8 of 25. UNLV, even worse, 5 for 21. So, in order to win this game, Seton Hall's got to defend the three well. Um, another guy that I feel like he's not going to show up in the stat sheet a lot for Georgia, but I just, he stuck out in my brain because of his name and his appearance. Guy by the name of Blue Kane. Um, <laughs> um Guy, you know, he's got the man bun and all that. Like, um, first of all, unless you're a samurai, there is no need for you to have a man bun. I I said what I said, okay? So I'm going to leave it at that. Are you going to tell Joel Embiid that? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna remain consistent. Like you know. Like I, last thing I want to be is a hypocrite. So if you got a man bun, unless you're a samurai, just stop it. Get some help. Um, but I mean, honestly, you know, like Georgia, they have balance in their scoring. Um, I had to point out Blue Kane, but Thomason and Abdur Rahim. Uh, those are the two guys that you got to really key in on. Um, Ab- Abdur Rahim, particularly, you know. He's a six eight guy that can do a little bit of everything, um, but I don't know Seton Hall. I know they'll have a game plan to defend against a guy like him, um, because honestly, if you're thinking about the scout team, like if they defend against Dre Davis in practice, I feel like they can defend Abdur Rahim in practice and treat, um, you know, like treat Davis guarding him like they're guarding Abdur Rahim in the game. So I think that'll play into Seton Hall's advantage. Um, I think Seton Hall, they will get to the championship. I got him beating Georgia by eight. I feel like Georgia is going to want to speed it up a little bit, but it's not going to affect Seton Hall because they have sped it up in all three, in, in you know, the three games they played or haven't, they haven't been afraid to. And I, if I'm not mistaken, they have scored. Let's see. I'm going to do the math in my head. They have scored. Near, I mean, they're averaging almost 80 points a game in this tournament. Like, Offense hasn't been Seton Hall's calling card, but the fact they're averaging almost 80 points a game in this tournament, they could definitely score at a high level, although I think they're going to defend at a high level, I think. Um, so I'm going to have Seton Hall winning um, in this quarter, in this uh, final four game by eight over the Bulldogs to get to that NIT championship game. Uh, Pat, what's your take? Uh, yeah, I, I think that it would probably be a disappointing performance if they lost to Georgia. I think that, you know, on paper, you know, again, Georgia probably has to play one of its better games. Now, again, Georgia has played better more often frequently in the last couple of weeks uh, than they than they have not. Uh, and again, you know, you, you let those two guys you mentioned, Thomas and, and uh, Jahir, then you let those two guys go off. Uh, Georgia gets some confidence, uh, you know, you, and again, you, you again, you're talking I go back to this, they have nothing to lose. So, you know, if they, if they fall behind, uh, you know, if, if they just go out and just, you know, lay it all on the floor, you know, then, you know, who knows what would happen? You know, you could have somebody go, go off. On the other hand, 
you know, we, we thought that there was potential for this to happen against North Texas and potential for this to happen against UNLV. And it never materialized from either of, of those two teams because the defense locked in and locked in early in both of those games. And if they get the same type of, if you, if you see the same thing happen, because again, you know, again, this is a winner go home situation. You know, this is something where, you know, your, your season is over if you don't step up right off the bat in this game. So I think that there is that type of mentality. And again, for players like Alamir Dawes and Jaden Bediaco and for who knows who else, you know, this is, this is their last game in a seat in the hall uniform. And I don't think they want to go out in a way where, you know, Georgia runs them off the court or they don't make an effort. And that's why Georgia beats them on Tuesday night. So I think if Seton Hall puts an effort out there, uh, Georgia's going to have a hard time countering that. So, and honestly, like that urgency, you know, playing like this could be your last game, like that has been with the Seton Hall team the last two weeks. And it's been Really, really great to see. I mean, they could have easily, you know, like Villanova, for example, they could have just phoned it in, but they didn't. Um, they they played like they've wanted to win desperately the last three games over the past couple of weeks. It's not going to change now because I mean, you're you've come this far. Why let why take your foot off the gas? So, in ironically enough, you know, in the city where you know the uh, iconic Indy Five Hundred takes place. Um, you can't take the foot off the gas, especially if Dre Davis too. He is going to lay everything out on the line as if he hasn't already. He's going to have even more incentive to do that now that it's back in his hometown, a place at Hinkle Fieldhouse, by the way, where he's been so good in the two years he's been in a Seton Hall uniform. Uh, it's going to be a really special homecoming for him. Um, and I think he'll seize the moment by beating Georgia and then either Utah or Indiana state. And I mean, let's get into this. I mean, if you're Seton Hall, who would you rather face? Number one, and number two, um, who do you who do you actually think is going to be Seton Hall's opponent um, it, on Thursday if they reach the title game? You definitely would rather play Utah than Indiana State uh, because Utah's going to walk into Utah has played about maybe a little bit better than Georgia, but you know, there's the same type of you know underperformance. Uh, from from a Utah team uh, that you get from a Georgia team. Uh, and the other thing you have to factor in with Indiana State is you mentioned Hinkle Fieldhouse. Uh, Terry Holt, Indiana, which is where Indiana State is, is an hour away from Hinkle Fieldhouse. And there's a reason why the two games on two, the, the doubleheaders on Tuesday and Thursday are sold out because, you know, the, the they will bring, Indiana State is going to bring their crowds and going to bring the noise. Uh, they will probably do something similar in terms of crowd noise that the Connecticut fans did up in Boston last weekend, which which helped the Huskies out so much. Uh, plus, you know, look, let's let, let's also look at a couple of things. Indiana State and Seton Hall sort of are, are parallels in terms of two teams that walked into the NIT with a chip on their shoulders because – both thought they had a compelling argument for an NCAA tournament bid. Uh, you don't go 32 and five by accident, the way Indiana State has done this season. Uh, Josh Schertz is, you know, one of the best coaches that, you know, one of the best mid major coaches in the country. And there is a reason why he was in discussions to take over at DePaul, in discussions to take over at Louisville in discussions to take over at West Virginia. That guy can coach. That guy can game plan. Uh, and then you get to probably the cult hero of the NIT, uh, Avila, the big guy for Indiana State. Uh, and you, you, you saw what DJ Burns has done for NC State in their run to the NCAA tournament final for the last couple of weeks. Avila is a, is a player sort of in the same vein, except – Avila does a couple of more things than Burns does. Avila can step out to 23, 24 feet and knock down the three-point shot. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, you don't want to – that guy could be a matchup nightmares. That guy has a whole bunch of things that Eric Dixon of Villanova has. Uh, and he's three inches 
he's three inches taller and he's probably about 20 or 30 pounds bigger. Uh, now, the flip side of that is, you know, how well can he move up and down the court? You know, you play a team like Indiana State, and, and you know, one of the things that a Jaden Bediaco and Elijah Hutchins Everett, if, he, if he's playing in this game, uh, may be looking to do in that type of matchup is to try to wear Avila down a little bit. Uh, because, again, if Seton Hall can go deeper in the center position, uh, it, it makes it all the more important that Avila stays on the court uh, because Indiana State has a drop-off uh, when they go to their bench. So, you know, again, you, I, you, the Utah matchup's a little bit, you know, the Utah matchup has its own perils because they they, they can start two seven-footers. Although starting two seven-footers is not necessarily the ideal thing uh, to want to do against the Seton Hall team. You know, the, and one of the seven-footers is a guy named Brendan Carlson, uh, who, uh, you know, he's he's a, he can go. He plays more like a stretch four than he plays a than he plays a traditional center. He can go out and shoot shoot the three pointer the way Avila does. Uh, so he he could be a serious matchup problem. But again, I don't know if Utah's got the type of Utah will certainly not have the home court advantage and the major incentive to play well that Indiana state is going to have in this game. Of course, the flip side to that is that Indiana state walks into this NIT final four with all the pressure in the world. Uh, you know, again, they, they, they are the home team. Everyone in that building, not everyone, but most of the people in that building are going to expect them to win. Uh, they've put a lot of expectations upon themselves. Uh, so that's that's a team that, you know, you could see them, you, you know, you could see them stuff, maybe panic a little bit, maybe get a little bit nervous uh, playing a high level opponent like a Seton Hall on Thursday night or maybe a Utah on Tuesday night. Uh, and we'll have to see how they respond to that. Now, they've had they've had some tough games in the NIT. So, you know, that they are probably you could say either they're through the most nervous part of this thing, or you can say that they're, you know, you, you, you could also say maybe they have a little bit of an idea that this is for fun. Uh, this is for, you know, that th this is something that they, they're playing loose with nothing to lose uh, and, and see where it goes from there. You know, I, I, I really, Indiana State's a team that's impressed me all season. So, you know, you don't want to see a team like that that knows how to win, that knows who they are, that's well coached, uh, that that probably, you know, it, it's that, that that's a matchup. You think that's just something to just sort of think about and worry about if Seton Hall gets to a matchup with an Indiana State on Thursday night. Yeah, I mean, I, I just from looking at how good Utah looked against VCU, but then again, it's VCU. They were the eight seed in their bracket for crying out loud you know they beat nova then they beat south florida and then and then they get to utah and it was just game over like utah just pummeled them um in indiana state you know again i feel like the they haven't traveled at all like they played all three games at home um and then they barely got by cincinnati um they their last couple of games they've had some difficulty um including the one against minnesota in the in the second round you know I mean, I really like – I mean, I think Utah could very well beat them, um, but I really do. An Indiana state Seton Hall matchup in the NIT final would be a dream matchup, at least for NIT standards. It's weird to, to, that I'm saying this, but you got Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Larry Nerd, which would be more apropos because of the goggles and because Larry Bird went to <laughs> Indiana State. Um to match up against Shaheen Holloway and, you know, like you have two great, you know, guys that, you know, I mean, shirts against Holloway would be a great, great matchup of, of coaches and, and their teams too. I mean, the thing about Indiana state is, man, they're good. They could fill it up. They got five guys who average double digits, including Avila. So I think if there's anyone I'd be worried about, I mean, in terms of like the matchup itself, you talk about this two seven footers from Utah, uh, Lovering and um, Carlson, but you know, like that could pose us because Seton Hall doesn't have a lot of height outside of Betty Ako and Hutchins Everett, but the better team is clearly Indiana State. So, 
I think matchup wise, I mean, Utah is a is the inferior team compared to Indiana State. So you'd want Utah. But ultimately the expectations, they're gonna get Indiana State. And that is going to be a hell of a game. And I feel bad for anyone that won't be tuning in. Because if that ends up being the final, that is going to be absolutely electric. And you don't love basketball if you're not even remotely interested and would want to tune in at some point Thursday night. Um, So, yeah, the fact that it all comes down to this. Um, Again, NIC Final Four, we got Georgia. (sighs) hate the fact that we get the late tip on Tuesday night, 930 on um I believe it's on ESPN if I'm not mistaken. Right. right yeah, it, it, but it is it is why it, I mean that's that's just sort of that's the way championship basketball is. You know, you you, you we sat through sweet 16 games over the weekend, the, the ones Friday night. You know, we sat through Creighton if if you were a Big East fan, you sat through Creighton playing the late game on Friday night, uh ultimately losing to Tennessee. So I think that that's just, you know, if, if that's that's just the way it works at this time of year, you want to, you know, but the alternative is not playing at all the first week of April. So if it's if it's a difference between having to stay up on a Tuesday night, the first week of April and, you know, worrying about the transfer portal the first week of April, I choose worrying about a Tuesday night at Tuesday night, 930 start than worrying about, you know, which which guy from uh let's say uh Sienna that we're going to get in the portal uh next week so that that's that's sort of you know I'm not sitting there like okay I need to track every guy you know we can worry you know let the teams that are not playing this week I mean you you think about I thought about this a little bit there are eight teams left playing in major college tournaments the four teams NC State uh Connecticut Illinois and Alabama not Illinois I'm sorry NC State Purdue, uh, Alabama, and Connecticut playing in Phoenix. And then they have the four teams that are playing in Indianapolis. So you got eight teams left. That means something when you're playing this deep in the season, even if you're playing in the secondary, t- what people perceive to be the secondary tournament. So, you know, that that's just something where that's something you can hold over the heads of every, there are nine fa- fan bases in the Big East. They are not worrying about playing basketball this week. And there are 350 fan bases in all of college basketball not worrying about playing this week. So you've made it, even if you did play in the NIT, uh, to be one of the last teams standing entering the most important week of basketball in the college basketball calendar. So, you know, that that's just something just to think about how special a place this is. And, you know, we, again, we, I'll go back to something I said a couple of weeks ago when we made the NIT. You know, I don't think it means anything less of this team if they go out and they lose to Georgia on Tuesday night. I don't think you can take away the 23 wins overall, the 13 wins in the conference, the win over Connecticut, the win over Marquette. All of those games are still going to meet, and particularly the three games that they won at Walsh over the last couple of weeks. I mean, that this team has made its mark on this season, whether they win everything in Indianapolis this week or they go home either on Tuesday or, on, or they lose on Tuesday or they lose on Thursday. So I think that that's just something to keep in mind. You know, yeah, you want to win this uh, and you'll feel bad if they lose tomorrow or they lose on Tuesday. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, this is a special team. Uh, I don't know if you put them in a category of the 2016 team or some of the P.J. Carlissimo teams that made it to the final eight or the elite eight, the sweet 16 or or deep into the NCAA tournament. But I still think there's a lot to take away from this season, uh, you know, depending regardless of how things turn out uh, out in Indianapolis this week. You know, this Seton Hall team this year, and it's crazy for me to say, you know, and you mentioned like 2016 team, even like 2020, uh, 2018, 19, like that string of five straight tournament teams like that Kevin Willard coached this this year's team. I'm not saying they trump 2016 or 2020 or hell, even 2018, but they're right up there as one of my favorite Seton Hall teams. I've had the pleasure of watching as a fan since I first attended Seton Hall 
uh, 10 years ago when I enrolled as a freshman, um, I really want nothing but the best for them. I really want to see this season end. And, you know, I really believe that, you know, good things come to good people. And Shaw's a great guy and a great coach. Same same with his staff. Um, and he's got great players who are also great people. They've gelled together as a group. And again, good things come to good people. I really think this is going to, you know, and it's nothing against Indiana State or Utah or Georgia, but I don't know. I'm just manifesting Seton Hall winning the NIT uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it looks great for the conference. The Big East, I love the conference so much. It looks great for them. And it looks obviously great for the university too, because it takes momentum into next year. Um, and at number two, um, I mean, we're going to have the distinction and I'm going to sound so juvenile for saying this, but you know, when you win the NIT, you're the 69th best team in the country. Nice. <laughs> right. It's a nice well, distinction yeah. to have. I think you are a little bit better than that though. I mean, I think that that's, you know, I don't want to get into a deep conversation about what pe other people have said yeah. about how stupid the selection committee looks Sure. Uh, about, you know, how badly Virginia's played, how badly the Mountain West played during the tournament. Uh, how badly a couple of the other at-large teams they let into the tournament got in. I mean, you can't really you can't really bash NC State because NC State got an automatic bid. Yes, they they earned their way into the tournament. So you know that that's sort of but but you look at some of the teams that were the last at-large teams that just got embarrassed in this tournament. And and you know I think it you know not even looking at even the the low major automatic bid teams. I think Seton Hall has proven on the court that they earned, you know, they, and even even the fans of St. John's and Providence who have watched, who have had comments about how the NIT has played out will acknowledge that Seton, you know, they, they were acknowledging that beforehand. But I think it's it's confirmed with anybody who knows the sport that Seton Hall looked more deserving in how they've played in this NIT than teams like Virginia and Colorado State and Texas A and M and no, not Texas A and M. I'll leave that Mississippi out. Virginia, State. Uh, Mrs. Yeah, some of the schools that just totally tanked in the and and the Mountain West schools. You know, let's think about it. what. How many wins did the Mountain West get? They won three games, six teams in the tournament, three games. Two teams won the three games, and one of them was it was the Colorado State team that beat Virginia. Yeah. So. If you want to think about this, there were five Mountain West teams who only came home with one win in the first four combined. Uh, and you're not telling me that Seton Hall wouldn't have at least been competitive, if not beaten, those other five Mountain West teams. I'm going to leave San Diego State out for a second yeah. uh, because I think San Diego State, besides their loss to Connecticut, played reasonably well. But the other five teams from the Mountain West just were almost absolutely no shows in mm -hmm. the NCAA tournament. Uh, so in that sense, I think that, you know, that that's you that's but that's a different. Con First of all, it's sort of a it's sort of a moot conversation. It's sort of like a what if conversation. But on the other hand, I think that you could that's certainly fodder to use going forward uh, sort of as an epilogue to the snub that Seton Hall got in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, and you know what? Like they're gonna, you know, I doubt that um, you know, because the NIT is different than the NCAA, um, but they're you know, who they you know, their committees and who how they select the field and all that. But like I hope Dr. Charles McClellan will be there. And, you know, um then if slash when Seton Hall wins, you know, I'm you know, I'm gonna be <laughs> I would be one of those people that's gonna be super petty and you know, Seton Hall's you know, the confetti's gonna come down, I'm gonna look right at look at right at the doctor. It's one of these. <laughs> which is different. Like I normally would have gone with the bird. I normally would have, but you know what? Like considering my rant a couple weeks ago, I'm going to tone it down a little bit, but, um, but yeah, like, you know, again, uh, let's just, let's just win this whole damn thing. I mean, we're, we're so close and it's the way this team has been playing. Um, I just really, really like their chances. I really think it's going to come down between us and Indiana state. And hopefully it will end with Seton Hall winning this game. Um, and I guarantee that that is going to be a barn burner of a game if 
they do meet the Sycamores. Uh, I think even Utah would be a good, fun matchup, but I think everyone that's following this tournament really wants Seton Hall and Indiana State, and I hope that's what it ends up being, and hopefully it ends, you know, for our sake, that Seton Hall wins the NIT, and hopefully that's a clean sweep um, on the men's side will, you know, culminate with UConn, you know, going back to back. Um, you know, at this point, you know, we may hate them during the season, but at this point, it's the Final Four. Go Big East all the way. Um, so that's why, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, want, we want UConn to win the national championship, especially if Seton Hall wins the NIT. This could be a damn good year for the conference as a whole. But, you know, obviously Seton Hall should have been in the tournament. But, you know, the next best thing is winning the NIT and getting a raisin banner in Walsh, as you said, Pat. Um, so uh, this is the last episode of the season. Well, well, for the regular season, for this season, you know, we'll have, episodes or after the season you know to recap the nit final four and all that good stuff and then you know we might i'm hoping that we can get maybe swing you know a couple interviews with you know like players and maybe even shaw ryan whalen we'll see how it all pans out but um pat you know what are your thoughts on this um on this final uh episode of the of the actual season you know well again i think i i don't want to reiterate a point i just made but i think it's I I think I share a lot of your sentiments about this team being very fun to watch. Uh, this team, you know, they had bad games. There were games they disappointed us. You know, losing losing to St. John's in the Big East tournament was a disappointment. Uh, getting blown out by Creighton, Connecticut, and Marquette, and and the Rutgers game was a disappointment. But on, I, more often than not, this team answered the bell all season. Uh, and hopefully they can do it two more times this week, uh, get themselves uh, the, their first NCAA, N, NIT championship since the 1950s. You know, it'd be nice, you know, when you walk into Walsh Gym, uh, you see an NCAA, NIT championship banner, you get to put this team, and, and it's not really a fair comparison because historically that 1953 team, uh, Walter Dukes, Richie Regan, Oh, yeah. uh, th- those types of guys, they were uh, at the end of the season because of the way things were back in the 50s. Mm-hmm. Uh, they ended up being ranked number two in the AP poll because there was a parity between the NCAA and the NI- NCAA tournament and the NIT tournament. So when Seton Hall ran through the NIT tournament, uh, the-, the voters ended up making them number two in the country. Uh you know, whereas I think that when you win the NIT, that doesn't that probably puts you in the top maybe 50 or even maybe top 40 in the yeah. country. It does, and certainly no one's going to put Seton Hall on a level of any of the teams playing in Phoenix this week. But on the other hand, you know, again, you know, given what the expectations were going into the season, uh, I think that, you know, even being at this point, I, I think that they overachieved regardless of what happened in the NIT. And I think winning an NIT tournament puts them puts the cherry on top of what's been a wonderful season. So you know, let's see, let's see them come out on Tuesday and hopefully Thursday, uh, take care of business against you know good but not great teams until you get to Indiana State, which is a team that's probably on our level, uh, and just do what we do all season. You know, play our game. Let's see Dre Davis. You know. Score inside and out. Let's see Alamir Doors hit some threes. Let's see Kadari Richmond just control the ball all night. And, you know, you put a combination of those two, three three things together, and Seton Hall is going to be very hard to beat this week. Couldn't agree more. And, you know, talk about that, you know, back in 1953, you know, that Seton Hall team was ranked number one in the country for six weeks. And, you know, everyone talks about how great 2020 and 1989 and 2016 were – it's hard to beat how great that 1953 team was. Uh, obviously, we weren't around for it, but I mean, clearly, I mean, the rec center where Walsh Gym is, it's named the Richie Reagan Athletic Center for a reason. Um, so, you know, take take that how you will. And not to mention Walter Dukes, single greatest rebounder in the history of the NCAA, arguably. I mean, he averaged, what, like 30 rebounds a game or something like that? I mean, it, it was absurd. Um, you had to be there to see it uh, back in the day. <laughs> I don't even think they kept track. <laughs> we talked like it had to be the. <laughs> Damn it, I wonder Pat. if we can. We should put somebody on the show who actually did. <laughs> if you're an alumni, if you're 80 years old and you saw that, 
If you were in Matt, if you were in the old garden in the fifties and watch Seton and watch any games with Walter Dukes in it, or even Richie Reagan hit us up. We would love to talk about it. Like this <laughs> now, this is now this is a must for the, uh, for the end of the season, but we digress. <laughs> we got in, we got a real, we got an IT championship to win this week. And hopefully we, that becomes the second NIT championship in the, in the school's history. So for Pat Madden, I'm Tim Best. Thanks for tuning into this week's edition of Poison the Colors. Until next time, onward to Tonia. Go Pirates. Let's get that banner for Walsh, baby.